Thank you, God, for inspiring us every day to use our voices to speak out against injustice, our hands to help those who are vulnerable, our feet to learn to walk in the other person's shoes, our hearts to pour out compassion and empathy, our minds to apply solutions in ways that make a difference. Thank you, God, for reminding us one person can change the world, that all you need is faith the size of a mustard seed and courage the height of a shepherd boy and wisdom that's given to anyone who asks. Entire generations have marched towards a hope they thought they'd never have. Mindsets have changed when there seemed only a dim chance. You, Lord, walk the streets of every community, watching, listening for those who are willing to say, here I am, Lord, send me. History has shown us what you can do when one single soul becomes willing to do your work. May we be willing today, Lord, to make a difference. Well, hello there, here I am again. <laughs> we are in Wednesday night Bible study is where we are and we will um, have another subject for you, which is warnings. So I wanna tell you in advance to get your paper, your pens ready because I'm going to be, we'll be teaching from Ezekiel chapter 28, the whole chapter. Um, I will give different uh, references, different scriptures, so you, you will need to jot them down. It's too much to put on the screen. So get yourselves ready, and then we're going to pray us in. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for you being so gracious to us, Lord. Thank you for your, your grace and mercy, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, that you have, again, allowed us to see another day. Lord, we're glad that we have your word, that we, we don't get, uh, our Bibles have not been taken away from us. They haven't been burned. We have all kind of Bibles, Lord that we can study your word to show ourselves approved unto you, a workman that's not ashamed, not ashamed because you don't know what the word says, uh, that we can rightfully, with not just accumulated knowledge, Lord, but with understanding, you said in all you're getting, get yourself some understanding. So thank you for that, Lord. And then I pray for wisdom to know what to do with what we learn, Lord, how to apply it to our lives, how to make it work, Lord, because it's relevant. It's relevant for today. It was good for them and it's good for us. Good for them in the old days and good for us in 2022. So we thank you, Lord, for the privilege. Again, we ask you to bless this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so our subject is warnings, 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 warnings. We're coming from Ezekiel chapter 28. Uh, God offers grace. Remember this. Remember and listen to the words. I'm going to give you scriptures, but God offers grace to the humble and brings down the proud. So if, if grace, if you're looking for grace, you can go to James chapter 4, verses 6 through 10. James talks about uh, grace. And do see, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and do season, he will lift you up. He talks about grace that he gives to the humble, the humble person. And then Proverbs 16, 18 says, let's turn over, the, well, you can write that down. 
A haughty spirit comes, a haughty spirit comes before a fall. You need to watch out. Pride goeth before destruction. Pride goeth before destruction. Keep yourself in check so you don't get the big head. So Proverbs 16, 18. And again, I am coming from the NIV. So my wording might be a little, little, a little uh, different from yours, but it is the same meaning. Let me give you a little background on Ezekiel. Ezekiel was um, a priest. He was being trained to be a priest in Judah. But because of the sin of Israel, which they did repetitively, and it, it, they did it all the time. It's just like we do today. We keep doing the same thing over and over and over. But thank God for his mercy and his grace. When we confess and repent, God is always there. But the Israelites were hung up on idol worship. Every time they got around uh, idol worship, they start joining in. Same thing that they did uh, in Ephesus. Same thing. Same thing was going over there. And God had richly, richly blessed them. But because of their disobedience, God turned Judah over to the Babylonians to chasten them. God said, y'all going to keep doing this? Well, I'm, I'm going to show you what's going to happen. So they took captives from Judah over to Babylon. And Ezekiel was one of those men. Uh, they left some behind. I don't know how many men they took. But they took the, the, the most of the men over there. And Ezekiel was one of them. And during that time, he was training to be a priest. So they, they get them over there. And while they are over there in captivity... God calls him to be a prophet. So not only is he a priest, he's a prophet. Who does he prophesy to? God's people. He said, you, they're, you're all of y'all in captivity, but I'm going to raise up a prophet. And I want you to tell them what thus said the Lord. And make sure you tell them this is what the Lord God says. So he ends up over in Babylon, and he's basically a street preacher now, kind of like John the Baptist. He's a street preacher. He's preaching, prophesying, and y'all know about prophets in the Old Testament. Nobody liked them because they always seemed to bring a message of doom. Well, that's, that's why God sent them, to correct, to tell the people what thus said the Lord, you know, God didn't deal with man one-on-one. -on -one. He dealt with the, the prophets and the priests. And then the priests and the prophets communicated to us. So here, he's over there, and he says, I want you to tell them I'm displeased with them. So here, he, he's, he's trained to be a priest. He ends up being a prophet. He's a street preacher. He got his calling back in chapter 2. Now, if y'all want to know all, all of this stuff, this is some good stuff. Y'all need to get in the Old Testament sometime and just, just mull and lull yourself in the Old Testament. It makes it very clear why we needed a savior, if you understand anything about the Old Testament. So God gives him this vision, and he's in the vision. And I'm going to give you a little review on the background of what's going on here. Um, Ezekiel 25, we're not going there, but you, you can read this later on. Between Ezekiel 25 and 32, there were seven nations that God told Ezekiel uh, to prophesy against. God was not pleased with these nations. Now keep in mind, these were all great nations, great nations. And God had saw fit for them to be there. And you know, when I was studying this, my mind always goes back to America. I think of America and I think about uh, all the richness and the wealth that we have here. I think about uh, the, all the stuff that comes in, if you looked at it during COVID, you saw all the ships were backed up. That's commerce, y'all. That's, that's all of the stuff we need coming in. And we have to pay for that. We have to pay for that stuff. But here was, the background is, he had a little art against these seven nations. Many prophecies against other nations, God did. He, prophet, he had them to prophes 
prophesied. They're, they're listed there, and I'm not going to go through all that because we're not going to study them. But one of the main one is uh, the city of Tyre, T-Y-R-E, and that's found in chapter 27. That's the next one over from where we are. Tyre was a wealthy, 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 wealthy. Tyre was stationed right here. That, that, that uh, whole group of people, that, that establishment was here, and on one side was land, which belonged to the Israelites. On the other side was the, the, the seaport, where all the, everything came in. Everything came in to Tyre. And so God told Ezekiel to prophesy against them and to have a morning session about them. He said, uh, let me get over here where it says, he said, prophesy against Tyre and have a lament. A lament was like a funeral service. You know how you moan and everybody's moaning and crying and and if you've ever seen it on TV in Israel, they carry the coffins up here and, and the, the people are behind wailing and wailing and moaning and crying. And, and that's how they give their sentiments over the dead. He said, I want you to wail like that for this city because this, this city, this town, this place is going down. That's how irritated I am with them. So in verse 27, I'm giving you a little bit of background. He causes that because Tyre, Tyre, I'm sorry, was full of pride. But all the commerce, again, kind of like Ephesus, came through there. So they were very prosperous. But God had a plan. God had a plan for them. And if you read all of 27, you'll see everything is listed there that, they, that came through on their ships, that came to the town of Tyre. Everything came in there. They were wealthy, rich 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 but they weren't taking care of the poor they were sell, selling people into slavery and i thought about sex trafficking some of the same stuff we doing y'all all of that was coming but they were they were just uh elaborate and expensive and everything i'm i'm thinking about beverly hills and hollywood and las vegas bright lights and uh you know and i even think about houston you know, we lit, we so proud of our little town, you know, with all of the cheating and scamming and killing and everything that's going on, it was happening in Tyra, and God didn't like it. A few things that he had against them was because they rejoiced, these, these uh, nations that God had these the prophecies for, they rejoiced in the downfall of Judah. When, when God let them be taken captives over to Babylon, they got excited because they said, yeah, that's good. That's good for you. And they started mocking them and saying, now we can get their land. They were greedy. They were greedy. Now we can get their land and we can have it all. We got it made. Now, where is their God? What happened to God? He can't protect you now. You in captivity. We got this thing. Greedy. They all, God had already blessed everything that they did and that's like us we take stuff for granted we live up on the hill you know we're driving two and three vehicles uh you know our stuff is just sent uh, you know nema marcus just sent us stuff <laughs> to see if we like it and then take it back and we just riding high and calling ourselves lovers of god not caring about the poor not uh, doing anything so th this was a uh, tire was in bad bad shape they mocked God's people. They even helped Babylon take the siege. When they, when they ran in and took over, they were a part of that. In some kind of way, they were planning it. But they always wanted more. Now, you know, riches, ain't nothing wrong with riches. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing when God blesses you there. I know a lot of millionaires, we buy their products, and they still worshiping God. I've heard stories of millionaires who who God has blessed them to be millionaires, and they still pay tithes on their millionaire money to the Lord. They still are, go to their house of worship and worship God and give to the needy and charities. So it's good when God puts you in that position, but don't forget how you got there, and don't forget who allowed you to be there. And that's where Tyre was. 
The more they got, the industry was booming. The more they got, the more prideful they got, the more arrogant they got, the more greedy they got. So it was a lot of going on with these tribes here, with these nations, I'm sorry. So now we want to go, that leads up to 28, and this is where our text comes from. God's uh, blessings has shifted from, okay, I gave you all of that, but in the end, if you read all the 27, God say, time is up. You're going down for all of this. So the blessings that had, he had bestowed on them now is then transferred to judgment. Okay, you ain't in the blessing. I ain't blessing no more. I'm judging now because of what you did with what I gave you. And so he goes straight to the top in 28. Now he says, prophesy against the king. So now we're going to the leadership. The king was doing the same. So he knew what was going on. What that sound like, y'all? He was sitting in his palace and letting all of this stuff go on and not stopping it. Y'all know what I'm talking about. This was only, well, let's put it this way. He had four years uh, in the White House. Let's put it like that. So, so here he is sitting in his palace, looking out the window at everything that's happening and saying, ha ha, I got it going on. And look what God says. Now, I'm not going to read all of this to you because, again, it's too long. I will just hit on spots here. But God, God's blessings on Tyre shifted. And this is a shift. He went straight to the leadership. Why? Because leaders set the atmosphere. Leaders set the tone for the land. Your kings, your queens, your presidents, they set the atmosphere. They're the head of government. So he went straight to him. And look at verse, um, now I'm just gonna be reading and if y'all don't keep up, that's fine because I, I may not, I might skip scriptures, but just know it's the whole chapter when you go back and read it for yourselves. But he says here, in the pride, this is verse one in chapter 28, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, say to the ruler of Tyre, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Now, I want to put emphasis on that because that's repeated during this whole chapter. This is what the Lord says. Ezekiel was saying, look, don't get, don't, don't get your jaws tight behind me. I'm telling you what thus said the Lord. This is what God told me to tell you. Okay, so you can take it up with him. He says, in the pride of your heart, you said, I am God. Now, don't we have a problem with that? We kind of talked about that last week. Uh, in this Bible, it's a little g, but in the King James Bible, it says, you said that I am God. It's a big g. So he said, God is saying, you think you equal to me. That's what the problem is. You, you are so high and lifted up that you think you're equal to me. He said, I sit on the throne of God, big G. Hmm, who that sound like? <laughs> in the heart of the seed, he's talking about his merchandise that comes in there. You are mere mortal and not a God. This is what uh, Ezekiel is saying. Though you think you are wise as a God, you're not. You know what? A man's way is always right in his own eyes. That's what the scripture says. Um, Proverbs 16, 2. And, and in fact, let me turn there right quick. Proverbs 16, 2. I should have had that marked. I don't know if I have it marked or not. Yeah, Proverbs 16, 2. All a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. So, you think you're right, you think you're good, you think it's all going on, but God knows what's deep-rooted in your heart. He knows. And then Proverbs 5.21 says, For your ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all your paths. There ain't nothing that you can do that God don't know why you did it. 
You can explain it away if you want to, but God's got this. Down at verse 4, he says, Your wisdom and understanding, you have gained wealth for yourself. Selfishness, greed, and amazed gold and silver in your treasures. Then he says, verse 5, By your great skill in trading, you have increased your wealth. You ain't thinking about nobody else. You sitting back with your feet up. And because of your wealth, your heart has grown proud. The love of money. Now, again, I think we talked about this last week. There is no evil in the money itself. Uh, money is for spending. That's what it's for. To get the things that you have need of. And if you have abundance, well, God bless you. Just like he had blessed the king of Tyre. But you better remember where your blessing came from. It's the love of money that gets you in trouble. When, when you're never satisfied, you need more and more and more. God was upset. He told him, you know, I want you to have a dirge for him too. Mourn for him because he's in trouble. The king is in trouble. And keep in mind that God's timing is not the same as ours. So we thinking people getting away with stuff, but you know, a thousand years is, is a day with the Lord. That's what the word says. So it ain't no problem. Time don't have no constraints for God. God is the one who created the time. So it ain't no big deal. We're thinking people are getting away, but they're not. And God also said in Second Peter, he says, don't think that I'm slack about what I tell you I'm going to do. The way you think I'm being slack. He said, you think I'm easy on evil. He said, no. He said, what it is, I'm giving y'all space so that the Holy Ghost can save your soul. That's what I'm doing. I, I'm ha I have mercy on y'all so that y'all can have space to get yourself together. That, that's what he said. That, that's why. I, it's not my desire that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's what God wants us to do. But if you got a big head and you don't think you need to repent of nothing and you refuse to examine yourself, you're going to be just like this king. Hmm. Verse 6, therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. There it is again. Because you think you are wise and you think you're a wise God. <laughs> You know what Proverbs 3, 7, and 8 says? Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil, and it shall be health to your navel and mar to your bones. Don't think you all that. Because God will take the wisdom of this world in Corinthians and turn it into foolishness. Okay, so he says, I'm going to bring foreigners against you. He said, you, you're going down too, just, just like the city, just like the town. You're going down. Verse 9, will you then say you're God when I take you out? You're going to say you're God then? He said, you know what? The nation's going to be, them other, them other tribes that laughed at you, they're going to keep on, they're going to laugh at you just like they did when the town was destroyed. They're going to laugh at you because they're going to think, okay, you, you said you was God, you ain't nothing either. Look at you because I'm going to bring you down too. We need to learn from what's happening around us. We need to learn that this stuff is not new. What's going on in America, what's going on all over the world, wars and rumors of wars and, and fighting and and bombs and all that stuff, it might be a little different but how we use it now, but it's not new. There's nothing new under the sun. Everything that is has already been and it's going around again until the Lord Jesus comes back. Now, when we get down to verse 11, I'm going to have to read a, um, a footnote that I have just to make sure you all get this. Um, it says on my footnote, the verses 12 through 19, now you might have a footnote in your Bible that's good. You can check it out. But check out the, the footnote on 12 through 19. But this Bible says some of the phrases in this passage describing the human king of Tyre also describes Satan. Great care now listen to this, great care and discernment must be taken when interpreting these verses. So don't, don't, don't think you all that smart that you're going to put it all together. Be careful how you interpret this. 
Then it says, it is clear that at times Ezekiel describing this king in terms that could only apply to a mere human. This king had been in the Garden of, Ye of Eden. This king was anointed a guardian cherub and had access to the holy mountain of God. Mm, what that sound like, y'all? But he had later been expelled and banished from there. Ezekiel, therefore, may have been, may have been condemning not only the king of Tyre, certainly one of Satan's agents for evil. So the whole thing is that whatever, I, use, I think this is a, my personal opinion, I think this is a, a, a parable like Jesus gave when he was speaking to the disciples when he didn't, he already knew that um, the Pharisees were not really interested in him. They were just nosy and they just wanted to imply a whole bunch of rules and regulations on him. And, and Jesus would talk to the uh, Pharisees, the, talk to his disciples in parables, giving an earthly example, but comparing it to heavenly things, okay, so that they could understand it. But they, he didn't reveal the understanding to the Pharisees, just to the ones who are really following his little intimate group, the seven. So I think this was a parallel of Satan. I think it was. And he said, he himself who had motivated the king to sin. Now, you know, that's the way the enemy works. But to kind of get to the end of this and to finish this up, it says in verse 11, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, take up a lament. Here we go again. You better mourn for him. He's in trouble concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the Lord God says. You were. Now notice how many times that comes up in, in every other verse is you were, you were, you were. And this will tell you what God had done for him, where he was. It tells you a lot about the position that the king had before he got full of himself. He says, you were the seal of perfection. He said, you were perfect, perfect. I put my signature stamp on you. You know, in, in biblical days, uh, it, it, when the king sent out a, a edict or a new law or something he wanted done, it was written on a scroll and he would give it to his soldier and tell them to take it to the, whoever he was sending it to and he would put his seal on it so that when he got there, he could say, this, this is from the king. And to prove it, look, his seal is there. That's what God is saying about uh, the king, and we don't know what the king's name is. I don't know. I did a little research to find out who he was, and, and I didn't come up with anything. Maybe you all can find something. But he says, you were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You was a fine young man. You was good looking, very strapping. Verse 13, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Now, Again, that could be talking about Adam, you know, because God kicked them out too. But it could be talking about uh, the devil because he got kicked out too. Or he could be saying, I'm not, I'm not going to add anything to God's word that's not there. And I'm not going to take anything out uh, that, that is there. But he could be saying, the same thing I did back then, I'm, I'm going to do that to you. That's what he could be saying. He says, you were in Eden, the garden of God. You were basking in, in God's glory. And verse, oh, the end of that says, and every precious stone, the end of verse 13, I'm reading the second part of it. Every precious stone adorned you. And it names all the stones. And of course, there's emeralds and there's diamonds and beryl and all of that stuff. And he says, your setting and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. So God, all, God created everything. There was not anything that was created that was not created by him. So God created this king too and set him in a good place. He put him in a good place. You know what the word says? I know the thoughts I have towards you. Good thoughts. You know, that you should prosper 
and be in good health. That's what the word says. So God has set him up. And interpreters, interpreters have said those stones that are listed here, y'all can read them. I'm not going to go through all that. Uh, those are the same stones that you see on, if you've looked at movies, biblical movies, or, or seen sketchings of what they think it looked like. They were all over the priest garments. In fact, look at the Pope in England. Look, look at all the stones those are expensive stones. God said, you was shining. You was all of that in a bag of chips. I had you. Man, you had it going on. You, you had so much stuff, you could put your jewels on your garments and wear them. That's how God set it up for him. So here he says, after he talks about the stones, we drop down to verse 14. He said, you were anointed as a guardian cherub. Now, see, that makes me think, well, that wasn't Adam. Uh, but Satan was an angel. Y'all remember? Satan got kicked out of heaven because he wanted to be God. So he says, you were a guardian angel. You were not, you were a guardian cherub. And the difference is the cherubs was the highest order of God's creation. They were the ones that were exalted, you know. They were seen in the scriptures is always lifting up God. They, that's, that was their job, to lift up God, to uh, exalt God, to make sure he, he had a job to do. As a guardian angel, he, he, his position was to cover the Ark of the Covenant. Y'all know what the Ark of the Covenant is, where the showbread, uh, the manna, rod, uh, uh, Moses' rod and all that, the covenant, the, the, the box that was there, You've seen pictures where the angel's wings are over the box, guarding the precious things of God. They had a job description. They guarded the way to the tree of life. God posted angels when, when Adam and Eve was expelled. We talked about a little bit about that last week. The guardian angels stood camp there. Ain't nobody else coming up in here. It's blocked. And God didn't destroy the garden, because we talked about that. We're going to be in a garden, all right, and it's going to be in paradise. So everything that we have need of, just like God prepared everything that Adam and Eve had need of before he created them, he had already laid it out. It was already ready for them. He knew what they were going to need. Then he made them. He created them. The same here. And you will see where it says, you were anointed. That means God had given him power. He had set his hand on him. You were a guardian cherub. You were ordained. I approved you. I was satisfied with you. You were on the holy mount of God. Wherever God was dwelling. See, now who was in heaven and got kicked out? Again, there's a parallel there. That's why I think it was a parable. Uh, we know the enemy was kicked out because of he wanted to rise up and be God. He says, your settings, oh, I'm sorry. Um, you were on the Mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. That's talking about all the stones that was on him. You, when you walked, everything lit up around you because of the jewels that were on your garments. You were blameless in all of your ways. He said, I made you perfect. Now, that doesn't mean that he was perfect. It means that his character and his integrity was intact. He wasn't a loose man. He was, he was a man of, of reverence. He was in position. God had put him in a place. God had a plan for him, what he wanted him to do. Now, he's saying all this stuff. Ezekiel is saying all this stuff to the king, telling him. This is what the Lord says about you. He says, you were blameless in your ways, from the day you were created. He said, I made you that way. I made you that you, you're a man of character, strong character. And what you do behind closed doors is what you do in public. You're the same, you, you are set up. He said, and look at the end of verse 15, till wickedness was found in you. Hmm. Though your widespread, tr widespread trade you were filled with violence. Remember I told you about uh, having slaves? The city was doing all, the town was doing all that. You had, you were powerful, but you were greedy. 
You were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God. I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. He said, you, you ain't going to wear that, that breastplate no more. That's it. He lost all of his privileges. Well, God is telling him, he's prophesying to him, and he says, you're going to lose all your privileges, all of your blessings. He said, everything I've bestowed upon you, you're going to lose it. Your heart became, look at verse 17, your heart became proud on account of your beauty. You thought you was bad. You forgot all about me, your creator. And you were corrupt. You have corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. Hmm. Something to think about. I threw you. And this word threw doesn't mean that he just said, okay, get out. Uh-uh. God did a slam dunk. He, like lightning bolts, the Bible says, he chunked them out. Like the old folks used to say, chunked them right on out of heaven. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. And so here it is. He said, by your many sins and dishonest trade, I'm on verse 18, you have desecrated your sanctuary. He'd exchanged all of the holy things that God had done and treated God like he was common. Like everything God had done for him was no big deal. That's how he treated it. It was common. He said, you treated my stuff. It was a sanctuary. I gave you everything you needed. It was a place where, where you could meet, that there was an opportunity for you to meet with me. He said, you took that and turned it into a common place. You took, you had idols up in there. Same thing happened in Ephesus, y'all. And I reduced you to ashes on the ground. Now, you know, I'm thinking about the serpent. In the sight of all who were watching, all the nations you knew are appalled at you. They're, they're sick of you now. You have come to a horrible end and will no longer be. And so God says, when the righteous are in authority, guess what? The Bible says the people rejoice when the righteous are in authority. But when the wicked are in authority, take your minds back to a couple of years ago, y'all. The people mourn. The people mourn and grumble. Notice the repetition of the words, you were. Keep that in your head. Whatever you are, you don't have to be there tomorrow. Just keep it up. If it's, if it's not centered around the Lord and all that he has done for you, we better keep our attention on the Lord. I want to say, um, I'll give you this scripture, 2 Peter 3, 8 and 9, and I believe I kind of already explained that. I think it's where it says... Uh, don't think that God is slack. Okay, let's just turn there and we'll close out with that. 2 Peter 3, 9 and 8. 9 and 8. Dyslexic, okay. 8 and 9. How about that? But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Warnings all over the book, all 66. You know, this is God's will and testament. You know how when your mother died, your father died, and they left you a will, they left the will, and they wrote instructions on there of what they wanted you to do or what, what they were going to give you or what you had to do to get what they were going to give you. That's what this is. This is God's will and testament. And if you don't know, if you don't ever open it up, you ain't never going to know what he wants you to be doing 
You're not going to know how to apply it. You're not going to know the blessings that God has in store for you if you never get into his word. I'm not talking about reading a scripture a day. Some of us have been saved for 50 years and we're still talking about, I read my scripture today. I'm talking about spending some time with the Lord, some quiet time where, where you still away. Turn off all of your, your computers and, and Facebook and Instagram. Turn all that stuff off. Turn your cell phone off. Tell your family, look, I'm going into my quiet time. That means don't bother me. Handle it. Whatever it is, handle it. I need to meet with God. Whether you get a, a powerful revelation or whether you just sit there and wait for God's presence. He said, if you draw nigh to me, I will draw nigh unto you. You've got to make yourself available. You've got to let the Lord know that you want to know what his will is. And when you start learning what his will is, you will be warned again. Don't get puffed up because I bless you with something. So keep, keep that in mind. Warnings. God has warnings so that we can repent. That's what it's all about. So God bless you all. Uh, I've exhausted as much as I can in this time. This is a very, very long text. But I think I covered uh, most of it. The bottom line was that God was going to take him down. And I didn't finish all of Ezekiel because it goes to another prophecy against another, um, another tribe, another tribe that he's talking about, that he's set, set on the prophecy against Sidon, I think is how you pronounce it. And he goes on to prophesy against them. But, but that's the end of our lesson tonight. And I hope it's something for you all to think about still away. And, and whether you felt God's presence or not, remember, we walk by faith. And, and God's word is by faith. Even your salvation is by faith. You've never seen God. You wasn't there when Jesus went on the cross. So by faith, believe that God will meet you there. You do it enough and he'll show up. I guarantee he'll show up. And he'll minister to you, and you'll have a new revelation from the Lord. So y'all be blessed. Thank you for having me. I have enjoyed it. It's been a wonderful experience making me study hard <laughs> uh, to try to get the main points without tiring everybody out. So I think it's time for us. Let's pray and close uh, this session out. You all be blessed. Father, we thank you. We just lift you up, Lord. We, we want to glorify your name. We bless your holy name tonight, Lord, for all of the things that you have done for us, Lord. And Lord, help us to remember uh, not to be puffed up when you bless us with things, Lord. Help us, Lord Jesus, to appreciate the act of giving. Help us to share, Lord, with others, those who are needed when we have it in the power of our hands to do so, Lord. Help us, Lord, to acknowledge you in all our ways. And you said you would direct our paths, Lord. Help us to lift you up, to exalt your name, because you are excellent in all your ways, Lord. Help us to recognize that you are God all by yourself, and you will not be shared with any other thing that we worship, Lord. And we say we don't, but we, you, know, you know our hearts. You know, Lord, there's not anything that we do that you don't know about it because you're, you're omniscient. You know everything there is to know about everything. And so, Lord, we, we're grateful today. We're grateful for your word that does not change just like you. You're the, it, your word is the same. This book has been around for ages and it's still here. This is the only book that doesn't get old and stale and, and we might wear out the cover, Lord, but your word, you preserve, you protect your own word, Lord. And there's power in your word, Lord. So we thank you um, that we're able to get into your word on a daily basis, Lord. I pray that you have encouraged hearts today, Lord, that you have caused us to think about the warnings that you give us, Lord. And to be sure that we recognize you when you speak to us, Lord. We're not going to know your voice from the enemy's voice if we don't form a relationship with you. We need to know this book. Because the enemy is doing his job. He is whispering in our ears, Lord. And sometimes we think that little quiet, gentle voice is yours, and it's not. Lord, help us distinguish between the two. 
and help us, Lord, to apply what we do know. You don't hold us responsible for everything that we don't know, but you do hold us responsible for what we do know. So, Lord, help us to be obedient to your word. Help us to remember that you said in John chapter 14, verse 10, I believe it is, it says, if you love me, keep my commands. God bless you all. I love you all and I'll see you next time.